Yep. Citizen science is, you know, wonderful um, equivalent of maker spaces for biology wetware in the Bay Area. Um, you know, um, there's Indie Bio, there's BioCurious, there's um, Capriculture Labs, um, and so I just really encourage you if you have any interest in this stuff and, and actually are piqued um, and interested by some of what I talk about. You know, there's definitely opportunities to get involved yourself if you're so curious. I'm happy to, to talk more about that later. Um, so today we're talking a bit about um, kind of my central research interests, which are um, you know, how can we think about reverse engineering a brain? And I'm going to start by motivating this and talking about why should we care about a model of the brain? Um, so maybe I'll start with the, the science fiction. Um, but first, what we uh, actually can do today. Uh, so out of curiosity, how many of us are familiar with deep brain stimulation? Has anyone heard of this? Very cool. Wow. Most of us. Uh, so deep brain stimulation is a, a technique um, that was discovered by accident. Um, a surgeon um, was treating a patient with uh, a severe Parkinson's tremors. And uh, they're going in to make some incisions. Um, and what they typically do before actually making incisions in a brain is that um, they will actually do an open brain surgery. Uh, and so uh, the patient is there, responsive, as the surgeon is going around and zapping parts of the brain before he makes a cut. And the idea is that if you can temporarily disable the part of the brain, and suddenly the person that's speaking to you is no longer able to speak, you know, maybe that's not a very good place to cut. Uh, and so, but it just so happened that the surgeon just hit the right frequency of stimulation in the right part of the brain. And he just happened to observe that the patient's tremors just completely stopped. So it's this classic story of, of serendipity. And uh, how this looks like today is that we'll implant an electrode very deep into um, a, a brain structure in the, the basal nucleus. Uh, and uh, stimulate it, and it seems to disrupt these, these motor activities. So this is fantastic that we can do this today, and people are looking at using deep brain stimulation for treating depression. Um, it was just a surgery a few days ago, um, prototyping a treatment for opioid addiction. Um, but we really don't have any sort of mechanistic understanding of how this works. It works. It's repeatable. You can do it in blind studies um, with sham simulations, real simulations, it works, but we don't know why. And Contrast sort of this current state of art with sort of the vision that I think many of us have when we think about brain computer interfaces, and that's, you know, can you fly that thing um, from the matrix where you know, Trinity quickly downloads a program into her brain to go fly a helicopter that she's never flown before? Like, how cool would that be? But I think right now in neuroscience, we can't even conceptualize 
how such a technology could work. It's not even like a, an engineering problem or a physics problem. It's just a we don't even know where to begin in order to be able to do something like that. Um, so having models can at least tell us something about like here's the state of a brain that can fly a helicopter, here's the state of a brain that can't, and you know how might you transition from there to there. Maybe it might be impractical to implement, but at least you might be able to know something about how that works. Um, so touching on health and disease, because I think this is also a very hot topic in terms of um, our uh, understanding of, of the brain right now. Uh, I'm going to start with an, an analogy here, um, which is to sort of describe a, a difference between a static way of looking at the brain versus a more dynamic way of looking at the brain. So the static way of looking at the brain is sort of schematized this idea of a canonical circuit. So the idea here, and the, the details aren't, don't matter, I just want to convey this idea that you know, there's one school of thought that we might be able to understand the brain by drawing nodes and edges and say that um, you know, this part of cortex connects to this part of the thalamus and these other brain regions, and then this forms some circuit, and here's this sort of snap, static snapshot of how the brain works, and maybe the, if you have disorder, it's because you don't have strong enough connections from one part of the brain to the other. Um, but uh, I think what I'd like to propose is that, in fact, the brain is a more dynamic beast than this. So let's say you are um, an insurance company, and you want to know something about uh, how uh, this car is driving, and if they're a safe driver. So let's say you just have accelerometer data uh, from the car. In absence of all the other vehicles that are around it, if you're seeing this car stopping and starting and stopping and starting, they might appear to be completely erratic. So looking at the activity of a single driver on its own might be difficult, but if in fact you saw that they were slowing down because the car in front of them was slowing down, that would tell you that, oh no, they're actually responding in an appropriate way, and maybe um, you know, they're they're maintaining a staggered position except for this moment when they're passing this driver, um, and you know, that could tell you something about their, their, their driving habits. Um, however, I think today in neuroscience, we tend to have these more static snapshots. Um, so here, um, there's a whole bunch of data that we're not gonna dissect unless someone is really, really interested. Um, but uh, right now, we, we typically will look at, say, um, let's look at someone that is depressed, um, and let's split up patient population into a bunch of different groups. And let's use this technique called functional um, magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, that allows us to observe this correlate of neuronal activity in a non-invasive fashion. So you can put someone into this big MRI scanner, um, scan their brain, and you're able to see um, the amount of oxygen that's flowing through the brain. Um, and uh, that tells you how much metabolic energy is being used. So if there's a ton of oxygen being consumed in um, this part of the brain, then that tells you that, oh, there's a bunch of neurons that are firing. And so uh, people have done this with some really incredible computational techniques. They've sort of been able to break up the brain into different regions um, and then uh, register a bunch of different individual brains to a common atlas that allows us to sort of compare one brain to another. And then look at how uh, sort of patterns of activations change. So does this happen, this part of the brain light up before that part of the brain? If so, maybe that suggests that there's this functional connection between these two areas. And so then they can sort of plot these functional connections um, between different axes of the brain and then look at how does it differ and they kind of purportedly come up with these different biotypes, these different um, signature changes in connectivity patterns from a depressed person to a non-depressed person. So, so each of those dots is a, like a causal link between two parts of the brain lighting up? Yeah, so actually um, each of these dots is uh, a statistically significant difference from a depressed people to uh, a healthy group of people. And I think the thing that I want to highlight here is that this is messy. <laughs> there are four clusters of depression that are identified, and they all have just like completely different um, patterns of significance. And this is one of the challenges today in neuroscience is that we look at people's brains that are depressed and the actual functional activity of the brain is just so wildly different between brains that even if you have a group of patients that have been, as accurately as we clinically can today, identified as having a similar disorder, that if you then look at their brains, they look very different. And so I think this goes to show that sort of these, these simple ways of looking at the brain in terms of these static connectivities is, is not really gonna help us all that much. Um, and so now I'm gonna switch gears completely and talk to you about zebrafish. <laughs> and the reason why I'm going to talk about zebrafish is because of a few reasons. Um, first, the larval zebrafish has one of the smallest vertebrae brains of the whole animal kingdom. Um, so that means it's a bit more tractable and it's a bit easier to understand. Um, secondly, 
Zebrafish, when they're in their larval state, are completely optically transparent. And so this is an amazing convenience for science. If you study the heart, you can see their heart during development. If you study the brain, you can see their brain during development. And we don't have to do any sort of invasive surgeries. Um, and third, uh, because of our tremendous access to genetic tools, um, and we've been able to breed and create all sorts of different fish lines that allow us to insert tools um, into the animal. Um, so this is sort of an approach which is called using a model organism. Um, so this is a bit of scientific jargon, but um, when we say model organism, we mean that here's an animal that is simpler to understand than say a primate or a human, um, that we might be able to ask some questions and observe more of the system and use more of our existing knowledge to, to try and understand it. And hopefully by doing that, then we can sort of progress and understand more and more complicated things. Uh, so just to give you a sense of complexity, um, this is a, a sampling of reconstructions of individual neurons um, in the zebrafish brain. So I'm just going to try to trace one here with my finger, um, and we'll see how well I succeed. But we have um, you know, a very long range projection coming here, cycling through, coming all the way up here, back into here, maybe there's a cell body. And you know, this thing might branch you know, to reach um, a significant portion of the brain. So individual neurons in the human brain might connect to as many as 100,000 or a million other neurons. Uh, and they might receive input from a similar number. And so if you just think in terms of, so the human brain has 80 billion neurons. The uh, larval zebrafish has about um, a million at an adulthood, or rather the adult zebrafish has about a million. The larval zebrafish has about uh, 80,000 neurons. But even at 80,000 neurons, there's this tremendous complexity in terms of how each neuron connects to thousands of other neurons. Um, but I think with this complexity, um, comes a beautiful opportunity in this model organism. Because of this optical transparency and because of some new optical techniques that I will discuss here in a moment, we actually have the ability to image the electrical activity of every single neuron in the brain as the animal behaves. And we, just in the past couple of years, have gained the ability to perturb ensembles of individual neurons at our whim. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean perturb? Perturb, yeah, great question. So. I'm going to sketch this out a little bit. So we have a neuron. And typically, a neuron would have a ton of dendritic processes coming in. So other neurons are connecting, synapsing onto our guy here. And uh, this neuron acts as a bit of a, an integrator. So in mathematical notation, we would say that it sums up all the incoming signal and it passes it through this nonlinear function. And what this essentially means is that this neuron receives a bunch of electrical impulses from upstream neurons. and at the soma, the cell body, there's sort of this integration that happens. And if it crosses a certain threshold, the neuron fires what I think is one of the most beautiful events in all of biology, which is, of course, the action potential. And uh, the action potential is remarkable because in this world of all this analog events, all these ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, the ionic messengers of electrical activity in the brain, is this almost mysterious digital event that the neuron fires or it doesn't. And if it fires, then there's this huge electrical impulse that travels down the axon, and if it doesn't, not much happens. Um, and this is largely true. What I'm saying is about 95% accurate. There, there are you know, some other funky stuff that happened. Um, but uh, the, the basic idea is that you know, this is, at least in common neuroscience parlance, considered to be the fundamental unit of the brain. And so as a result, we're very interested in understanding how, if you were to activate this neuron, what it would do to other neurons in the brain. And so what's remarkable is that we now have the ability to do this in a spatial manner. Um, and the way that this works is via a technique known as optogenetics. So I mentioned briefly that there's these ionic, you know, messengers, if you will, that we have potassium, we have calcium, we have sodium, and all these ions 
are rushing to and from over the cell membrane. And what, what changes the ability of these ions to cross the cell membrane are these ion channels. And so ion channels can open and close based on uh, intracellular uh, changes. Uh, and so the cell actually acts as a bit of a battery. So it, it maintains this electrical potential. It rests at negative 70 millivolts. And when the channels open up, because there's this potential across the membrane, these ions rush into the cell. And that causes this electrical impulse to occur. So the idea of optogenetics is that we've inserted an ion channel into the cell, such that when we add light to it, it actually opens up. And so the idea is that we can take a laser beam that is very precisely focused onto an individual cell, and we can spiral this laser over the cell, and we actually open up all these channels. And that it causes this electrical impulse to enter the cell, causing the cell to fire. We have a second protein that we put in the fish, which is a calcium indicator. And so the idea, and this is going to be schematized, or schematized, schematized? There we go. Some word. You get the meaning. Uh, we have this GCAM uh, protein. And the idea is that when it attaches to two calcium ions, it has a higher chance of emitting a green photon when we zap it with blue light. So the idea is that blue light comes in, one photon. Green light comes out, second photon. Green light has a longer wavelength than blue light, 510 nanometers versus 488 for blue. And so it has lower energy. So this is sort of a net energy loss. But the idea is that one blue photon comes in, it hits this. If it's in the presence of calcium, it has a higher chance of emitting a green photon. If the calcium isn't there, the odds of a green photon coming back are very low. And so in this sense, we can actually optically image the number of photons coming out, and that tells us how electrically excited the cell is. It tells us how much calcium is inside of the cell. So there, these are two techniques that I just described. One, optogenetics, which allows us to, uh, using light, to electrically excite a cell. And the other, genetically encoded calcium indicator, that allows us to image how excited the cell is. And if we uh, use proteins that are designed with uh, spectral separation, we can actually image using blue light and we see the green light that comes back and we can stimulate using red light. So by using different wavelengths of light, we can actually do these activities at the same time. And so what people have started to do is to, say, stimulate this cluster of 10 cells in the center of the brain. Uh, this is the raffine nucleus. And then look at the activation patterns across the rest of the brain. So in this case, there's a net excitation in the uh, lateral habenula, and the more medial habenula is inhibited. So that's more excited is in green, inhibited is in, in pink. Uh, and so they've done this systematically for a number of different areas of the brain. And you can sort of see this um, you know, connectivity pattern that emerges um, from this. So what does this look like? sort of at a higher level. So for fish, um, we need to make sure that they're not swimming, or else it's very hard to keep a microscope over them. And so we basically embed them in, in agros, which is kind of like jello. So we embed their head, their tail, it's been, the agros has been cut out so that they can still wag their tail, we can kind of observe it. And then we might do some different visual stimuli. A classic one would be a, a looming stimulus. So you have a, a light um, dot that emerges, and then it, it kind of grows in size, uh, or a shadow, uh, it could be a shadow that it grows in size, and then the idea is that, oh, that might be a big fish that's above me that's coming down to eat me, and so I better, I better get out of the way and swim. And if you put it on the left side, then the fish will sort of you know, flip its tail to the left, so you know, it'll try and escape to the right, and vice versa. Um, and then we also have, uh, so we have this microscope objective that's positioned above the fish's head, and we have these two different colors of light. So we have blue light for, uh, well, actually, it should, be, it should be green. I guess my screen color has changed a little bit. I'm in a, nighttime mode here. 
Let me see if I can uh, kill that off real quickly. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so we're, we're imaging, um, we have blue light to excite, and then green light will come back. And then we're able to uh, stimulate using, using red light and scan the laser. Then we can use a, a DLP projector, just a standard uh, you know, light projector to project different stimuli underneath the fish. And finally, we can image the tail movements using this, this infrared camera. So we can illuminate the tail with infrared light, and uh, that way the fish uh, can't see it. And by the way, if anyone you know, if, uh, wants to chime in with any questions, you know, please interrupt me as I go. I'm happy to, to go for any directions that people are just in. So uh, today, oh, yeah. so back on that previous slide. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so there's going to always be some level of activity going on, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're going to you're going to pick that up because you've got these the dyes or whatever in, in, in the fish. So so you're just looking for deltas. You're looking for differences. And is that is that what's highlighted here? Only the differences, or are we seeing all the activity? Yep. So great question. This is uh, indeed the differences that we're seeing. Okay. Um, and this is the differences that are averaged over. Um, several trials. Okay. Uh, so that's one way to sort of amplify your signal to noise. Sure. Um, I'll show you some raw data here actually in a couple slides which you might uh, get a kick out of. Um, the, the, the signal that we have is uh, compared to a decade ago just like staggering progress. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely staggering. You know a decade ago uh, getting recordings from a dozen neurons concurrently was a big deal. Now I routinely do 25,000. Wow. Uh, and so it's just you know unbelievable progress. That said, we're still in, by standards of you know dealing with not biological data sets, uh, very low signal to noise regimes. That's a great question. So all four, all four of those one moment in time. And oh they, yeah. And then they're are they different layers of the brain or? Yeah yeah. So let me let me explain a little more what we're looking what we're looking at here. So here we're looking at different uh, planes of the brain. So. Uh, we have, oh, I need it. Oh, thank you. Eraser, napkin is a perfect <laughs> eraser. I was going to use my shirt, but. <laughs> One of my uh, favorite professors in, in undergrad, I was this amazing Soviet, phys Soviet USSR trained physicist. And uh, he would come into class each day with this, you know, blue sweater and this uh, collared shirt that would stick out. And you'd have six different colors of chalk. And by the end of class, he'd just be covered in chalk, just like all the colors all over. And it was magical. It was 10 minutes later, you'd see him, and he's just completely pristine again. And I'm convinced that he just had racks and racks and racks, of, like sweaters and shirts, <laughs> exact same one in this closet. The last, I didn't come prepared enough to have a, a spare change of shirts. So uh, the fish. So we're, we're looking down on the fish's brain. And so, you know, it's a happy fish. I'll get rid of that. Um, and so what we're now going to do is, from this top review, we're going to change our z-plane. So we're going to look at um, different sort of cross-sections of the brain. And so this is the, the shallowest one here. And then we're getting progressively deeper into the brain as we go to the right. Um, and then what these uh, right panels show is they show the mean trace of different regions of the brain. And uh, this shaded region is at the point of stimulation. And so what we see is that for um, this uh, simulation here in the raphe nucleus, that as expected, you know, neurons in the raphe also have a significant you know, increase in fluorescence. So these are the neurons that we're stimulating. Um, but uh, kind of more interestingly, um, in the inferior oligocorp, um, which is here, we see this um, big increase. And then um, the trace isn't shown on the right side. but if you look at the Havani weather, it would be uh, a very large increase during that simulation period. So, I'd like to show you at least a little bit of raw data, because I think raw data is kind of fun. So what we're going to look at here is, a, um, so I've, I've taken uh, imaging of the brain in a 3D volume. Um, and if people are interested in, in how we can acquire a 3D volume, I'm happy to go into that detail. Um, so feel free to, to chime in. Um, and I've actually done a Z projection. So we're looking at the maximum values across all these plants. 
So essentially what we're looking at is sort of this two-dimensional snapshot that summarizes the activity across this entire three-dimensional volume that we've acquired. Um, and so the fish is oriented like so. So the eyes would be about here. Um, up the top here, we have uh, a bit more of the olfactory bulb region, the habenula, and then here are more uh, areas of the brain that are associated with this is called the optic te tectum. Um, so associated with a lot of visual processing. And back here, we kind of get towards the hindbrain. And so in particular, um, here, this is starting to be the spinal cord. And so if the fish um, does a tail movement, you see a lot of activity um, back here. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to, to narrate a little bit. Um, but what you see is that, so those big flashes there was you know, a tail motion happening. Um, there's, sometimes you see fairly uh, symmetrical activity uh, across both hemispheres of the brain. Other times you see completely asymmetrical activity. Um, you know, there's sort of this standing activation of some neurons here that we don't observe as much on the, the other hemisphere. Um, and uh, something that's kind of cool is that in another 10 seconds or so, we're actually going to see the whole brain just kind of spontaneously shut down <laughs> and then come back. Uh, I don't have an explanation for you there. Um, the, the waves the, the moving across are really yeah, so there we go. the brain just sort of silences there and just comes back with fury. So there's a lot of really crazy stuff going on. And I mean, think, I think just by kind of looking at this, you can say, wow, there's, there's a lot of things happening, right? Um, and even as a neuroscientist, I look at this and be like, if you were to ask me, like, why did that turn on? I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm hopeful that uh, with some of the modeling work we're going to talk about that, we'll be able to actually answer questions like, why did this part of the brain turn on? Why did the fish decide to turn left at this moment, given this context of the fact that environmental stimuli? Uh, here we are. Yeah, so typically today, how people analyze this data sets in neuroscience is we'll take this, this image. Um, oh, and I, I neglected to mention that each of these little circles is an individual neuron. So we are, we are seeing, and some of these, you know, in this area, it's a little bit harder to see. And if I used a, a higher magnification microscope objective, you'd be able to see individual neurons more clearly. So right now, we're only able to really resolve the biggest ones. But even still, um, if you were to actually look at this video sort of frame by frame over a long period of time and, and look at um, how the light was turning on and off and you know filter out some of this noise that's observed in the background, uh, you'd be able to pull out uh, on the order of 25,000 neurons um, across the whole volume. And how we typically analyze this today is we would use different software that attempts to automatically identify components that make up the images that we're observing. So for those that are mathematically inclined, this is a form of matrix factorization. In fact, it's to be highly specific, a constrained non-negative matrix factorization. OK, let's explain that in uh, easier to parse terms. So we have a video. And during this video, we have all these frames. And we think that there are underlying neurons that are giving rise to these changes of light intensities that we're observing. And so here, for example, if you kind of zoom in, there might be this blobby thing that is turning on. And so the idea is that. Um, let, these are actually, this blob is actually three different neurons. Um, and so neuron one in red fires once, twice, three times, goes silent. A little blip fires once, fires again. Uh, another blip, you know, this yellow one has a different pattern of activity. This third one has a different pattern of activity. So the idea is that we can take these frames and we can decompose it into different components that can then give us these neuron traces. And so some modeling work I've been involved in um, for a paper that was recently published in Cell uh, built a recurrent neural network model where we actually attempted to um, take each of these neurons uh, that are in different regions of the brain, initialize an artificial neural network, uh, and then try to learn weights between neurons that allows us to recapitulate the activity that we were observing in these fluorescent traces. And so in this modeling work, we actually have a one-to-one -one correspondence between artificial neurons in our network and biological neurons that we observe. Uh, and so the hope by doing some of this type of work is that we might be able to answer some questions about um, what kind of changes happen um, in certain experimental paradigms. So for us, we are looking at the zebrafish in a behavioral challenge where the fish is exposed to inescapable electrical shocks. And the fish initially um, responds with this active coping where it's swimming vigorously to try and escape the shocks, and then transitions to a passive coping regime where it, it kind of gives up a learned helplessness of sorts and stops responding. Um, and so this is uh, important because um, 
A similar phenomenon has been described in mammals and even in human patients as associated with depression. Um, where if you take a healthy person versus a depressed person and you give them some sort of behavioral challenge, that a healthy person will continue fighting longer and a depressed person will give up faster and go into sort of this passive regime. And so this is one way that you can kind of draw analogies between a model animal and a human um, and try to look at um, in ways of, in levels of detail that we could never do in a human being, what kind of changes are done uh, under the hood. Uh, and so what we found by doing this modeling work was that um, we actually discovered that uh, uh, sort of independently of this paper, that uh, it appeared that this raphe nucleus was um, silenced um, during this transition. Uh, and the lateral habenula and the, um, actually was completely ramped up in activity. Um, and so it was sort of this interesting connection to our finding via this modeling work and what was actually observed empirically by doing these stimulations. And so I think this gives me hope that um, this modeling work actually isn't just sort of fitting models to, to noise and sort of you know, garbage in, garbage out, but actually able to come up with some insight that uh, translates into biology. Um, so there is a couple dirty secrets and things that are very difficult about trying to build models that recapitulate brain activity. And it all comes down to this fan out that I talked about earlier of how an average neuron connects with thousands of other neurons. If you don't know how neurons connect to each other a priori, if we have no prior knowledge of how neurons are wired together, there's this massive space of possibilities of how neurons can be connected. So to put it um, visually, let's say we have, we have uh, n neurons. So we can represent these end neurons at time t by a vector of activity. This neuron's at 10, this one's at 5, this one's at 0, whatever these values are. And so this is of length n. And let's say we have a simple model where we say that the value of the neurons at time t plus 1 is equal to, give me some math jargon, but I'll explain it. A linear transformation, just a matrix multiplication of some connectivity matrix, actually I'm going to call it J, times the current state of the neurons. So the idea here is that we have some big matrix where each entry tells us the influence of neuron J onto neuron I. And by multiplying it by a vector, which is nt, we can get back what happens at nt plus 1. So that's just for, for those of us that have uh, some linear algebra background that might make sense. If not, don't worry about it. But the idea here is that this matrix has to be of dimension n by n. So we have n squared parameters to fit, which is a, can be a big number. If you have 15,000 neurons, that's 225 million parameters you have to fit. Um, and so what that means is that, in general, we are underdetermined. We can't determine uh, which, what model is correct. That there are infinitely many values that we can choose for this J matrix that would fit the data equally well. And that's bad news for a biologist, because that means that we can fit a lot of different models and maybe only one of them actually corresponds to how the brain is wired. And the rest of them maybe are you know, just equivalent ways of fitting it that are mathematically correct based on the data we've observed, but we, if we observed way more data, maybe it would no longer be accurate. And so this um, has inspired me to think about an idea from Bayesian statistics known as active learning. Through some fancy words, uh, let me try to give some intuition for what I mean by active learning. Um, I'm interested in optimal experiment design. How can we design experiments to maximally reduce uncertainty of our model. So the idea, it goes like this. Let's say that you are a cat-dog discriminator. That you are just trying to figure out, your, your whole goal is to say, that picture is of dog, that picture is of cat. And let's say that uh, I give you the opportunity to run an experiment. I'm going to show you some photos, and you get to choose which one you want to have a label for to increase your knowledge and become a better cat-dog discriminator. So uh, here we have uh, three photos. And uh, if you could get a label, you know, if 
you could ask me a question and say, I want to know if that's a dog or a cat, and I would tell you. Which photo would you would you want to know the answer to? The middle one. Yeah, the middle one. Uh, any guesses? Is that a dog or a cat? Yeah. Cat. Yeah. Nice. You guys are good. Indeed, that is a cat. And so, if you looked at that, um, maybe if you're a machine learning model, I, don't, I can't speak for how everyone learns, but if you're a machine learning model, maybe you'd say, wow, you know, all these hair features are very similar between the dog and the cat. But if I look at the eyes, you know, there's some salient differences between what we see in dogs versus cats. And so maybe by um, choosing this middle photo, you would learn something about um, using these eyes as a way to distinguish that even if you saw you know, a thousand pictures of a cat like this, you maybe wouldn't learn as much. So this is sort of the intuition behind active learning, that there's a number of different experiments that we could do. In this case, there's a number of different photos that we could ask an oracle for the answer. Um, but perhaps there's an optimal way to say, what should we learn about next? So to translate that into neuroscience, let's say that we have uh, some neurons. We have two neurons, neuron A and neuron B. And we see their, their fluorescent traces, this sort of correlate of their electrical activity, and they're highly correlated. Neuron A goes up, neuron B goes up. They both go sort of in sync. So underlying that could be a number of different models. Perhaps A connects to B. So when A fires, some of that electrical impulse goes to B, and then B fires. And our imaging is fairly slow, relatively speaking, on the order of, of hundreds of milliseconds, while a neuron fires on the order of single digit milliseconds. And so to us, it looks like it's happening at the same time, but maybe in fact A is causing B to fire. An alternate hypothesis would be that actually, maybe A and B are mutually connected. They both connect to each other. Or maybe B connects to A. Or maybe there's this other neuron Z that is driving both A and B. Or finally, maybe it's just a fluke. Maybe A and B have no relationship and we just happen to be in a regime where they, you know, we observe this correlation and it's totally spurious. So if you just have data that you're observing of a, of a brain behaving, <clears throat> there's no way of definitively answering which of these models is correct. And so you might fit any one of those five models when you have this simple picture. However, if we have the ability to stimulate and perturb the brain, we can do a little bit better. Let's say that we stimulate A at this time point here. So, uh, and we see that, uh, well, I think I actually flipped the color there. Apologies. Let's say we stimulate B. Um, and we see that B gets activated, but A stays sound. You know, that lets us rule out some possible models um, in terms of what might be going on. Versus if we stimulate B, and then, uh, so just to be clear, um, you know, that would let us say that, so here I say we're, we're stimulating A, um, and nothing happens to B. So this model is probably not as likely to be true. This model is also not as likely to be true. Um, versus if we stimulate B and uh, both neurons go, then that might suggest that perhaps 3 is the correct model. And so this is the idea that um, at a, a high level, it's sort of this pairwise relationship of how we might be able to stimulate neurons and inform the connections and, and how um, we might understand what underlying structure um, may give rise to this. Does this idea make sense? Well, so, um, I'm going to shift to uh, another aspect of machine learning here that we're applying to neuroscience data sets. Um, and uh, this is an idea that actually comes from some recent literature on robotics. So just to give some historical context, in the 1950s and 1960s, neuroscience and AI are actually very um, linked together. There was this amazing paper um, by uh, Hodgkin and Huxley in the 1950s and 1961-62, actually a series of papers that led to their uh, Nobel Prize, where they did the first electrical recordings of neurons. Um, and they did this using uh, a sharp electrode uh, in these giant axons uh, of the giant squid. So these huge giant squid axons, they're able to record electrical impulses, and they're able to measure the voltage and the current that traveled across the cell. And they were the first ones to describe and to understand how this action potential comes to be. In particular, it was thought that neurons were at rest, you know, at a, a zero voltage, and that then it sort of spiked up. But by getting these very high detailed recordings, they're able to find out that they actually maintain this 
know, negative rest of potential, but then spiked up past zero and had this overshoot. Um, and uh, I think what was remarkable about that is how it very quickly spawned all these understandings about things in visual neuroscience. So subsequently, there's this beautiful series of experiments um, where researchers go in, they stick a sharp electrode into the cat's brain um, and awake cat uh, as it look as they um, move bars across the visual field, and they discover direction selectivity that there are certain neurons in the brain that uh, if you are moving a bar in one direction, the neuron goes ba 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 ba, fires very rapidly. Versus if you go the bar in the opposite direction, it doesn't fire at all. Uh, and that work gave rise to um, convolutional neural networks um, by Fukushima in 1980. Uh, and at the time, there was just this really interesting back and forth where neuroscience discoveries would suddenly make someone think about, wait, what if we built these um, computer models that have nodes that connect to each other and try to teach them a task? And how might learning take place? There's all this foundational research in terms of how uh, neurons that fire together wire together. How if neuron A is connecting to neuron B, and neuron A fires, and subsequently neuron B fires, and that tells you that this connection from A to B should be strengthened. Versus if B fires first and A hadn't fired prior to that, and they're connected, maybe that should be weakened because the information coming from A isn't as valuable. So a lot of these kind of fundamental learning rules came from these neuroscience-inspired ideas. But in recent decades, the fields have completely diverged. Um, AI is very detached from biology, and biology is very detached from AI. Um, it's kind of a joke, but uh, I saw <laughs> That someone did a, a very funny statistic uh, where they, they looked at the number of citations in the average biology paper um, as a function of the number of equations in the paper. And every equation was expected to reduce the number of citations by seven. <laughs> <laughs> so the communities have some um, disparate um, characteristics. But what I think is tremendously exciting right now is that we finally have these massive data sets, right? If you have one or two or 10 neurons, you know, you have one neuron you're recording and you're moving this thing back and forth. You can by eye to sort of see the results. But if you're looking at 20,000 or 100,000 neurons at the same time, and you have the ability to stimulate any 50 arbitrarily, we're, we're sort of beyond the regime, I think, where a human neuroscientist can sit down and stare at the raw data and gain understanding about how the brain works. And so this is where I think using AI techniques becomes very interesting. Earlier I talked about using um, AI to try and reverse engineer the brain. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about just trying to use AI techniques to understand. And, and bring out explanations. So uh, an intuition I'll give for this um, comes from this, the amazing results of um, Chelsea Finn and others um, for doing uh, physics learning from video prediction. So let me explain. There's a robotic arm that's up here. So this is, just focus your attention on these left videos here. Maybe just look at the top left corner. So this robotic arm is moving around completely randomly. And there's just some objects in this space. And there's a neural network that is just trying to predict. It knows the robot's action. And it's trying to predict um, what the pixel value will be of the video. And uh, this is kind of a crazy task. Because you just have, you know, the network doesn't know that that's an object, or that's an object, or that's an object. There's a bunch of pixel values. And uh, it's trying to predict what's going to happen. Um, and it turns out that these networks can do this quite well. And uh, remarkably, uh, they actually learn a representation of what these objects are and how these objects interact. Uh, and you can train a network on just predicting video pixels. And you can actually um, then, say, put the state of, say, I want this blue thing over here. And you can ask the network to come up with um, what it thinks would be a sequence of actions that would end up with that result. And the robot will be able to execute that path. So I think what's, to me, just, I was just blown away when I saw this. Um, because it was just shocking to me that just by this simple task of trying to predict what will happen in the future, that you can train a network to learn how to interact with the physical world. And people have done this for, you know, folding shirts or picking up a coffee cup or all sorts of things. Um, but I think what's remarkable here is that this idea of sort of trying to learn uh, some sort of latent structure and understanding. And uh, I understand that uh, latent is a, a little bit of a nebulous concept. So I'm going to show up a, a, 
a schema for those that are a little more CS inclined that might be interesting, but uh, bear with me if you're not CS inclined, I'll try to walk you through it. So my approach to this um, looks like so. So basically, our X's here are individual observations. So an X is a picture. So we have a picture that goes in, and we have this reconstruction that comes out. This is sort of, uh, this is uh, an estimate of what we just saw. I'll explain why we're doing that in a second. The picture goes into an encoder, and the encoder takes this picture, which might be very, very big, maybe 500 by 500 pixels. So there's a lot, a lot of numbers in there. And it collapses it to a latent representation, which is just a, a small vector. So maybe we went from 500 by 500 values to just 20 values. The decoder takes that vector and tries to reconstruct the image. And this is this reconstruction loss, where as we train this network, we try to tweak the parameters of the, de the encoder and the decoder such that the image looks similar. Uh, and so this is what's known as an autoencoder. So the idea is that by having this bottleneck, we can actually train uh, a transformation that has to do something um, with the information. So if you imagine that if you want to describe an object being, you know, if you want to describe my, my pen being right here on the screen, and you describe all the pixels of that, it would take a lot of information to do that. Versus, let's say you, and versus, you know, if you want to describe the pen being here, or here, or here, or here, or here, right, there'd be a lot of pictures you'd have to take to describe the location. Versus, imagine instead if you had one picture of the pen, and then you just had a coordinate system where you said the pen is at, you know, 3, 2, or the pen is at 9, 9. That'd be a lot more efficient because you just have, um, you know, one image of the pen, and then you have a, a bunch of um, ways of moving or translating it around. So that's just kind of give you intuition up here. There might be ways of coming up with, with clever strategies to um, encode it, and maybe that's how the network gets this notion of how objects are, are moving and being separate. So we can also use these networks to do prediction. So for each time point, we're doing this encoder to the latent space, and then this decoding, encoding, latent, decoding, et cetera, et cetera. So here, I actually stack a recurrent neural network on top of it. And the idea of this recurrent neural network is at some time point, it is receiving the latent information of where we currently are, as well as the previous outputs of this network. And it's integrating that into this context. So the difference between this context and this latent is that this latent just tells us something about the current time we're at, versus this context tells us something about the current time we're at, as well as what's happened in the past. And we can use that context to directly predict these latents in the future. So what I just described in a lot of detail is an architecture for a model that can predict future observations from a series of past observations. Did I, did I lose you? Are, are we following? Where, where is the, um, the actual robot on control figuring? Like, yeah. it, how is it, presumably the controls of the arm fi factor into the prediction? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a good question, yeah. So if you wanted to try and uh, uh, apply this to the, the, the robotic arm architecture is a bit different, but you can imagine having uh, in this X vector, you could have the arms movement, for example, and maybe that could be fed in. So how can we use a model like this? Well, one way is that there's this trick called back propagation, which is used for training the network. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but the idea is that let's say we make a prediction. Uh, we have our prediction ZT plus 1. And I'll put a hat here to denote that it's a prediction. And let's say that later we observe this actual XT plus 1 that goes in and gives us the real sort of latent. We can now compare these two and calculate some sort of loss for it. And the idea is that based on that loss, um, the difference between the two, we can try to, to bring it back through the network to all these parameters in our encoder and decoder and tweak the parameters to try and make these two values get closer together. So that's kind of the intuition. Um, there's also ways we can use this to try and understand what's happening. And I'm going to go pictorially in a second here. So if this diagram is really not working for you, don't worry. I'm going to be gone with it in 10 seconds. Uh, and here we can say, 
wouldn't it be cool if we could pull out how neurons are activating other neurons? Wouldn't it be great to know that you know, if this neuron turns on, it might influence all these neurons? Or why did this neuron turn on? How can we extract the information? Well, we can also say, let's pretend that a particular neuron turned on at our next time point. If that happened, what might have caused that? We can use the same trick where we say, hey, this value turned on. And we can blast that value back through the network and bring it back into these previous picture time points. I think this will be easier to show in a picture. So here, I've chosen a cluster of neurons known as the locus ceruleus, which is a panic center of the brain. Um, and so when these neurons activate, uh, you know, they certainly activate a lot to electrical shocks. Um, and they've been associated with all sorts of you know, fight or flight responses. So I say, OK, I want to know what typically precedes these neurons turning on. And I can back propagate that through my model. And then I can look at the result. And something I was quite excited by was that I, it shows, oh wow, you know, sure, if those exact neurons are turned on the time before that, that will tell you that they're more likely to be on in the next time point. And that's nothing too surprising. But the model actually pulls out you know, single neuron predictions as to what might be activating these neurons. Um, and so this is sort of um, where I'm at in my, my current research in terms of trying to build these types of models and pull out these hypotheses around what might be turning on this. And one of the next steps is I'd like to actually go in and optogenetically stimulate these neurons. So here, here is a model-driven hypothesis for what is turning on these neurons. You can imagine I might go in and stimulate that neuron and then see if that was accurate. Um, and where the active learning ties in is um, where would you stimulate to try and learn a lot about here? You know, if, uh, if you, you know, over here, it looks like nothing around here has an influence. So maybe it wouldn't be very useful to, you know, stimulate a bunch over here. Versus in here, you know, there's a bit more uncertainty. You know, maybe if you're to stimulate around here, you might be able to sort of get rid of some of that noise and come up with um, better targets for what could be turning on. So that's um, some of the tie-in with what I was talking about earlier with this active learning to actually trying to build better models. Some other things that we might be able to pull out. Um, actually, I'm, I'm starting to get low on time here. So I think what I would like to do is uh, just give you two flavors of what's to come. And then if you have any questions or discussion, you know, I'd be delighted to, to talk more. Um, but two flavors of what's to come are, first, I haven't talked at all about this notion of cell types. Um, so we're starting to be able to get these data sets where um, not only can we image the functional activity of the whole brain, but we can get some of the genetic information about each of these cells. So um, down here in red are these uh, ex are excitatory neurons, neurons that predominantly cause electrical excitation to other neurons, and in blue are inhibitory neurons. So you might imagine that knowing that a neuron might predominantly have an excitatory effect would tell you that the sign of the weight should be positive, that this neuron excites other neurons versus the blue neurons, maybe the sign of the weight should be negative, that this neuron inhibits other neurons. Uh, and finally, a uh, really cool technology um, that we've, we've just been getting off the ground uh, is called light field microscopy. And this is a computational microscopy technique that allows us to take a 2D projection of a 3D volume and mathematically reconstruct the entire 3D volume. So what that means is that from a single camera frame, you know, that we image at say 100 frames per second, we can actually reconstruct 300, we can actually reconstruct 100 volumes per second. Um, in this manner, we can actually, um, before when I'm talking about imaging the whole brain, we can do that at a very slow rate. I can do it at you know, about uh, one to three brain volumes per second. With this new technology, we'll be able to image every single neuron in the brain at about 100 times per second. And we'll be able to get uh, sort of um, much better resolution temporally about what's going on. Um, and so with that, I, I hope that I've given you at least a, a little bit of a flavor for um, some of the many crazy things that are, are happening in neuroscience. Um, and uh, thanks so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. On the latest uh, thing that you mentioned about stimulating the brain and relating to op opioid addiction, I mean, that's been all over the news. What, how soon will that result? I mean, yeah, obviously, it's going yeah. to be played out over a long time, right? It's a great question. Uh, so uh, one of the pioneers in applying deep brain stimulation to psychiatric disorders is Helen Mayfield. 
and she did some of the first um, deep brain stimulation implants for depression as early as 2003-2004. Um, what happened there was kind of an unfortunate story where despite some incredibly promising initial results that uh, some of the clinical trials as a classic case of uh, the scientist losing control of her <laughs> research narrative as soon as the corporate interests come into play. Um, uh, I think she was quite unhappy with how the actual experiment was, um, how the actual um, clinical trials took place in terms of their targeting of different brain regions and in terms of the lack of certain therapies associated. And so those clinical trials failed. Um, and uh, as a result, I think that was a major setback for deep brain stimulation for psychiatric disorders. Um, but you know, in any case, when you're looking at putting things in humans, um, it's, it's a really big deal to pierce the dura. Your brain has this membrane, it's really, actually it's really tough, you know, uh, tissue that surrounds it. And anytime you go through the skull and pierce the dura, you put people at a huge risk. Um, and so I think it's incredibly exciting and interesting, um, but it's going to be, you know, probably five to ten years before that's going to be a viable treatment path. And uh, I, th I think we might get there, but one of my concerns is that um, a lot of the data that we use for the human brain, it's like we have much coarser methods than we have in, than in lower animals. And even in lower animals, it'd be tricky for us right now to say, you know, here's where you should stimulate to cure someone of depression um, or cure someone of opioid addiction. So I'm, uh, I'm optimistic that we're on this new frontier that we have the mechanical ability to, to do this. I think that we can experimentally go in and try a bunch of electrical placements and find something that works and hopefully codify that into a repeatable process. But as a basic scientist, I'm hopeful that um, we're gonna have a chance to catch up before we implant too many people with electrodes um, without a great understanding of why it works in some people and it doesn't work in others. So these yeah, these uh, <clears throat> models. So you, you built some models that um, were um, you were basically modeling the physical structure that you were you're measuring with you know the lasers and everything. Um, and then and then did you try and excite those you know those uh, those virtual models and and did they mimic the the physical uh, <clears throat> the actual you know brains that you were you were modeling them after or like how, mm -hmm. how accurate was that and also how does that the follow-on is um, you, you mentioned the dynamic nature of the brain um, so you know wh what have you learned about taking this the, the, the dynamic you know what you're learning about the dynamic nature of the brain and applying that to the to the computer models yeah cool questions so for the first question um, so thus far, the modeling um, has trouble with predicting um, neurons that suddenly turn on. Um, and so I think it's for a few reasons. The first is because um, it may be that the information just isn't there because I'm imaging too slowly. Um, and then the second may be that um, if you just have a correlational data set, that it's difficult to come up with these sort of causal relationships that this causes this to happen. And so this is where I'm really excited by doing these optogenetic experiments. And I, I didn't touch on this as much, but um, I've been um, uh, injecting a lot of fish embryos um, with an attempt to make a new line of transgenic fish that will have both this um, red shifted uh, excitatory channerodopsin that allows us to stimulate neurons as well as this green um, indicator. So right now I just have fish that have the green indicator. Oh, okay. So I've been mostly observing that. But that, that's forthcoming. So that's kind of <laughs> the theory portion. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I plan on doing those experiments and then I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Uh, and then for the second question on the, the dynamics aspect, um, yeah, I think this is an area that to me is so fascinating. Um, there's this weird phenomenon that's been observed repeatedly that even though the brain has a ton of neurons, that they lie in a low dimensional space. So let me phrase this um, again. Uh, we have, say you have 100,000 neurons. In terms of the number of degrees of freedom, you can imagine that all 100,000 neurons could, in some universe, be doing a different thing and not have much relationship to each other. Versus the other extreme is that, you know, every neuron does exactly the same thing as every other neuron, right? And that would be a very interesting brain to sort of go up and down, up and down. Um, it turns out that reality is actually closer to the latter than the former. <laughs> that for some reason that uh, 
many of us don't really understand that even though we have so many nerves in the brain, uh, a lot of them have very similar activity patterns. Um, as a matter of fact, there's these uh, various techniques um, to reduce dimensionality of the data. So you have 100,000 dimensions of neuron space. Well, maybe you can go to 20 dimensions in latent space, and you can come up with a pretty darn good summary as to what everything is what was happening. And so this is something that's quite quizzical, which is why is it that low dimensional dynamics can explain so much of neural activity? Um, and I, I don't have an answer for you other than that it seems to be observationally true. So I think it's you know quite amazing that uh, a, rather than needing 100,000 things that are all interacting, that you can just have 20 things that are interacting. And it seems to summarize pretty well what's going on. Wow. Like redundancy or something? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's a ton of, ton of aspects here. Yeah, redundancy for sure. Um, but then there's all sorts of aspects of um, uh, maybe there's, it might take a lot of machinery to have learning take place. Um, I just heard an amazing talk by Jennifer Raymond, who's at Stanford, who's also on my, um, my thesis committee. Um, and she described uh, how a meta-learning rule is implemented in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is kind of way back in the brain. It's um, implicated in a lot of motor learning activities. Um, and it turns out that as you move in the cerebellum, some of the, the learning rules change in a structured fashion. So I mentioned briefly how there's this sort of this before that. So here'd be an example of a learning rule. So we have a, oh, my napkins. It's just behind the podium there. Oh, thank you. So let's say we have this um, case where A has a synapse on the B. <clears throat> and by learning rule, we're going to discuss what happens to the synaptic weight. So we oftentimes um, denote this connection by a number that signifies how strong it is. So 10 would be very excitatory, 0 would be it's not there negative 5 would be slightly inhibitory. So the idea is that this weight is not static, but it actually changes. And that, um, we believe, is one of the fundamental ways in that learning takes place in the brain, is how the brain adjusts these synaptic weights. So there's been decades of study as to how do these weights, how do the synapse strengths increase or decrease, and under what conditions. And so there's this classic learning rule, which is called spike timing dependent plasticity. Spike timing dependent plasticity, STDP. And how this works is that let's say that at uh, time zero, so this is when neuron B fires. So neuron B fires an action potential, this digital event. The idea is that we're going to draw, um, actually, we're going to have up here, this is going to be uh, delta zero. We'll call this, you know, delta five, and we'll call this rather uh, delta negative five, and that's delta positive five. So the idea is that if I draw a line that's above this curve, that means the weight's going to increase, and if I draw it below this curve, the weight's going to decrease. And so how you should think about this is, imagine that. A fires a single action potential. Based on the timing, that's going to cause this synaptic weight to increase or decrease. And it, the timing is relative to when B fires. So if A fires before B fires, maybe there's this increase in the weight. But if uh, A fires after B fires, maybe there's this decrease in the weight. So the idea here is that if A fires before B, then that uh, would increase the weight. And if, B fire, if A fires after B, then it would um, decrease the weight. So increase if A fires before, decrease if B fires after. Uh, so it turns out that this shape 
changes and is actually learned. So the task that was done um, is like a visual tracking task. So if there's something that's moving and the mouse is trying to track this object that's moving, it has to adjust its eyes. And so there's this constant feedback visually that's similar to a mismatch that I talked about in the model, this prediction, that if the mouse is trying to move its eyes, execute motor commands in order to move its eyes so that the object stays in the same relative location of its vision and it's off, then it's going to adjust some weights in order to make sure that it's right. Uh, and depending on you know, the speed of the object, um, you might need to make different speeds of motor movements, and it turns out that there are um, different sensitivities. So there are some neurons in the cerebellum that uh, will increase, well, will decrease the strength if A fires only 120 milliseconds after plus or minus five milliseconds. So anywhere before that, there would be no change in the synaptic weight, except for 120 milliseconds afterwards, it would decrease. And then there's other neurons that, no, not 120 milliseconds, it's 110 milliseconds after. And it turns the out- The library closes in 20 minutes. If you need a library card, please go to the service desk now. It'll say We're actually going to be logged 10 minutes before closing. If we need to print or make copies, please do so now. La biblioteca cerrará en 20 minutos. Si necesitas una tarjeta de biblioteca, por favor visite el escritorio de servicio ahora. Los baños estarán cerrados en 10 minutos. Si necesitas imprimir o hacer copias, por favor hazlo ahora. So it turns out that this type of specificity and timing only occurs in mice that are reared in environments with light. So if you raise a mice, a mouse in complete darkness, um, this doesn't, the, the mouse does not display this type of hyper-specific temporal sensitivity. And it displays more of this classic spike timing dependent plasticity. So this is an example of a result that answers, at least in part, an age-old question of, you know, how do we learn to learn, right? You can imagine that this would be a genetic component that maybe the brain is wired such that individual cells have these learning rules that are baked in ahead of time by our genes. And that it was over the course of evolution that we learned how to, how to learn. But in fact, this result quite strikingly suggests that at least in a part, one part, particular part of the brain that um, there's circuitry that actually learns to learn. That comes up with a learning rule that then allows the animal to do the task better. And my guess would be that this actually occurs all over the brain. And so why do we have so many cells? I think it's because our brains are dynamic. We aren't born with some structure that could be solved by you know, hundreds of nodes interacting in a set way, but rather we need to learn and we need to, to learn how to learn. And I think that requires a ton of machinery. It's very meta. Yeah, it's very meta. <laughs> uh, what does this change in weights look like biologically? I mean, what's happening there? Yeah, cool question. All right. so. We have a, we're going to try to draw a bouton. So here is a synapse. And so here we have the presynaptic side, and here we have the post. So there's a number of ways that you can increase synaptic strength. So well, I, I said that neurons um, use ionic messengers for electricity, that's only part of the story. That's true in terms of how electricity travels through the brain. But at the side of synapses, it's largely a, a chemical transmitter. Is, uh, is the synapse the join between two neurons? Or? Yes. So synapse would be where A attaches to, if I were to draw this you know, slightly more realistically, some axon comes off of A, and then it, it kind of branches out, and B has all of these dendrites coming out. And here, the axon of A, kind of the output of A, attaches to one of the dendrites of B, which sort of accumulates and brings all the inputs to the B cell body. And so on here are a bunch of, of receptors. And there's these vesicles that are trafficked to the cell membrane. And they eventually merge. And they dump these neurotransmitters I'm denoting by these dots into synaptic cleft. And uh, when a neurotransmitter binds to it, 
that uh, there's sort of this cascade of other messengers that uh, will activate ultimately some ion channels. And then that causes um, the ions to rush in. And so in, you can imagine that you could change the strength by increasing the number of receptors or decreasing. So there's like a mechanical building and destroying the proteins that's constantly happening. You could increase the number of vesicles that are available. Um, you could increase the, the size of the spine so you can hit more receptors and uh, vesicles to release sites on. Um, you could also have a additional synapses that form. So in fact, neurons typically synapse onto each other multiple times. Um, I mean, this, the story that I've presented in terms of you know, one node, one weight, one value is a simplified story that makes life easy. But in fact, there's all sorts of complications. Like, let's say that you have B here. And let's say that uh, you have A that kind of comes near B and uh, it connects. So here's my uh, connection site here. And let's say that A is inhibitory. And let's say C has some axon coming down. I'll try to draw a thick line here. And it connects to, to B over here. And let's say C is excitatory. In this case, if you were to trace sort of this electrical impulse coming down, you can imagine there's sort of being an excitation that travels to be there, fairly uninterrupted. And maybe this inhibition that A does is more local in this dendrite. But if A actually synapses to be along the dendrite that C was connected, then it might be able to inhibit the signal. So there's biological realities to how these circuits actually form that are tremendously complicated. And uh, I think we are, there are groups actually, there's a giant multi-billion dollar project in Europe called the Human Brain Project that's attempting to essentially model the brain at this level of detail, down to individual ion channels. And they're building supercomputers to do this. And they're sort of um, trying to do it from the bottom up. Take the statistics of how one neuron cell type attaches to another neuron cell type, you know, do the modeling of all these dendritic arbors and all these attachment, attachments and try and build models that way. Um, I think that uh, you really can't build a brain from the bottom up that way. And so the approach that um, I've been looking at this from is, is quite different, uh, which is more from the top down. I have a model family, these sort of artificial neural networks, that um, the first one I described has some parallels to the brain, but the second one that I described with the schematic of the encoders and decoders, not pretending that that's doing anything brain-like. Rather, I'm trying to make a claim that this model family is, uh, is broad enough that it can learn some truths about how the system behaves. So maybe the model will never be able to pull out that uh, A, you know, connects to this dendrite before C connects to it. But maybe it will be able to pull out this nonlinear effect of how A and C firing at the same time interact. Um, and so there's different ways you can think about modeling the brain and asking questions. And I, I'm a systems neuroscientist, so I like to think about circuits and the system as, as a whole. But there's wonderful work to be done um, from the very low levels of molecular neuroscientists um, to you know, the people that are in cognitive science. And so I think there's a huge space for, for all interests in the field. We, we need collaboration across all levels. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you could, you could do interesting uh, physics simulations without going down to the quantum level, you know. They're still useful, and they can still give us a lot of, shed a lot of light on how, how you know, things interact in the physical world. Absolutely. I have things to say, but I think Brenda has probably given me a cue here. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, it's time to wrap this up. Thank you for the active discussion. Thank you, Tyler, for yeah. a really interesting talk. Yeah. Science. <laughs> <laughs>